A lot of people don't know that Carl Icahn has actually outperformed Warren Buffett over the most recent years. He's one of the most successful investors of all time. And we need to really credit him for some of the things that he's done. So I want to spend time talking about where he comes from with you know, his background and the successes and the failures that he's had, trying to learn a little bit about how he structures his portfolio, just to really dive in and do a case study. In four days in 08, we made a billion and a half bucks for, because we put on those credit spreads and we made it on a, a couple of hundred million sure. invested because we had those credit spreads on. Carl Icahn is most famous for being what you would consider a corporate raider and he was really the one to sort of coin that term or to be the idol for that term. A corporate raider is really somebody who comes into a company, doesn't really have the best interest of that company in mind and you know, their only goal is to make money. So a lot of people have taken issue with that and how he bought businesses and sold off all the assets, left them with a ton of debt. He'll take a huge position in a company and try to really take control of that business or maybe even buy out the whole company altogether and then take control of the board. The board is really responsible for trying to make sure the shareholders are not being taken advantage of and they're getting you know, really the bang for their buck with the executive management. So the board of directors, they're almost like a representative in a government, right? And the representative is supposed to represent the interests of the people. The board members are supposed to represent the interests of the shareholders and the people that own the, the stock and the company. They're not making any money. And then you look and say, why don't you make money? And, and, and you'd start talking to guys that understood the company better than I did. You know, an analyst, he said, the reason, a call is that it's not that it's not great. It doesn't have a great name, great this. It's the guy that runs, it's an idiot. He just shouldn't be there. So I said, why can't we get rid of them? So they said, well, nobody, how are you gonna get rid of them? There's no accountability in that company. Clubby board. Clubby board, they're all buddies. There's... We today are in a crisis in our economy, I believe. And I know you've been studying this. We have a lot of problems. One of our major problems in this country, one of our major problems is management and their ability to compete. There's a symbiotic relationship between boards and CEOs today. And as a result, as a result, there is no way to hold these guys accountable except somebody like myself comes along or some other person who is really willing to challenge them. But you have to go through contortions. There's no corporate democracy. So you have to go to contortions to even challenge these guys. I call it anti-survival of the fittest when you see these guys who run these companies today, for the most part, with a number and number and number of exceptions. Fraternity president is the kind of guy that uh, uh, is a sort of likable guy, the guy that is always at the frat house. With me, it was an eating club when I, when I went to college. But he'd always be there, you know? And if you went over there, you wondered what if he ever studied. Because whenever you were feeling down, whenever you wanted to shoot a little pool, have a drink, your girlfriend didn't show up or something, you'd go over, and he was there. A likable guy, maybe not too bright, maybe even a buffoon, but like, likable, and, and uh, 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 also, a good pol political guy because you know there was always competition to be the head of the club and, and he's good political so he has all these qualifications he doesn't make waves he understands survivor being a survivor and he moves up the corporate ladder and this is what we have today they move up the corporate ladder don't make waves not a threat to the guy above them and they just keep moving up and up never had many ideas but just was there so this doesn't help our corporate corporations very much. It doesn't help us be competitive. It's the wrong people for this job today in, in our companies. But it just keeps moving up and moving up and moving up the ladder, right? And the board really doesn't care because the boards are all just getting there. When you go to a board meeting, the first thing you get your check, you look at it, you see a bunch of graphs they show you, the light is pretty bad, a lot of red lines, green lines, yellow lines, all going up. There's always something going up. You got some line going up, no matter how bad the company is, always lines. And I used to sit there. I mean, I'm colorblind. I don't even understand what the got on lines are. I don't think anybody does. And, and, you know, they always have that. So that's what goes on at your board meeting. And the CEO shows it, very smiling. And then they say, well, sometimes you say, well, George, you know, the CEO, well, well, how come we're losing all this money and this red line is going up? He says, well, you see, that's the line that we estimate in 1982. If you do the EBITDA from the double, blah, blah, Oh, good, 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 good. You're doing a good job. You know, where's dinner tonight, guys? You know, they're going to the boondoggle, got theater tickets, great. Okay, here's your check, great. And that's why you have the problem in derivatives today and you have all these headaches because the guys don't know how to literally run the company. So anyway, this guy, who's the CEO candidate, keeps moving up and up and up the ladder. 
He's a survivor. So this, as a survivor, he's not going to ever have a number two guy underneath him that's smarter than him. He doesn't want a guy that can challenge him because, God forbid, somebody on the board should meet the number two guy. And he's moving up and up the ladder until he becomes number two to the CEO. And now he's number two to the CEO. And, you know, sooner or later the CEO retired. Eh? The CEO puts him there because the CEO realized this guy is not a challenge because a little dumber than the CEO. So now he becomes the CEO. And now he finds his number two guy a little dumber than him. Right? <laughs> well, sooner or later, we're going to be run by morons, by, by definition. And, and, and <laughs> thank you. And, and, uh, uh, So what I find that's most interesting about him is the fact that he's 85 years old right now. He's 85 years old and he's really still crushing it. He's been in the, the, the investment business since the 60s, since 1960s. So somebody like that, I, I really see that as somebody who cares about the game more than the money itself. And of course, Carl Icahn cares about money, just like you know all these other crazy hedge fund managers. But um, I think really for him it is about the game because you, you don't make it that far and keep going and keep pushing at 85 years old you know, whatever, you could be on a beach somewhere, um, retired and never have to work a day in your life, and neither would his kids, actually. So let's flash back a little bit to Carl Icahn's childhood. So he grew up in 1936 in New York, very, very tough time during, you know, depression, the Great Depression, all that stuff. And another thing that's really interesting about him is he, he, start, he got started a little bit later than some of the top guys that you look at, like Buffett. Carl Icahn didn't really get started until he was in college. He actually went to, he went to Princeton but he went to Princeton for medicine. He studied medicine and then, you know, he actually got a degree in psychology. He went and tried to study medicine and, and it just wasn't for him. He's been a hustler since the beginning. His parents told him that they would pay basically the tuition for him to go to school, but they wouldn't pay for the room and board and that he would have to figure out how to come up with that money. So he had no clue how he was gonna do it. He committed and then while he was there, he started playing poker with people that he was connected with and he started making money playing poker full time enough that he could actually pay for his room and board for all the four years that he went to school. He's a really serious chess player. A lot of guys are into chess and poker and all these games that you know, re really have to think about game theory. And if you guys don't know what game theory is, game theory is just really how you should think about getting the best case scenario out of all sorts of different outcomes and, and really think about that ahead of time. So Carl got started in the business in 1961 where he went to go work as a clerk at E. of Hutton, a market making firm and a, and a brokerage firm. But if you guys don't know what a clerk is, you have the market makers that sit on the exchange that are the middleman between these transactions to try and make sure that buyers and sellers on both sides can really easily make trades and be able to get in and out quickly so they provide that liquidity. But as a clerk, really your job is to run orders back and forth and to really try and keep these guys organized, but you're actually not a trader. So he's really like a glorified intern, kind of like a paid intern, somebody who actually gets paid, but you know, not really what you would consider somebody who's in charge on Wall Street, somebody who's really, really, really in charge of things. So he started off from the bottom and really worked his way up. Studying how you pick stocks, and it really hit me how great it was, you know, what you did. I met a guy that was a security analyst, and he's showing me how to pick these was, stocks. Was it going back to the books? Was it reading things about the industry, or? Well, no, no, I just liked it, but that wasn't really it. But when I got into Wall Street, I had 12, 15,000, which was a lot saved, you know? I started investing it. And Jack Drivers would tell me, you come over, he sort of liked me, he'd sit there with me once in a while, and, and he said, you're gonna lose every penny you have. I'm telling you, Carl, before you're through it, he said, I got this. I was up to about $70,000, which wow. was huge. He says, he says, you know what? When this is over, six months, a year, maybe less, he says, not only would you have the 70, you'll be negative. Everything you ever had, and he was right. In three days in 62, they cleaned me out. I was, I was it, and I learned. I'll tell you what I learned from that experience. You didn't learn from him just giving you the advice. You had to go through the pain. You had to go through the pain. You have to go through it. The market is not a gambling casino, and too many people, in this type of market, too many people think it is, and especially now with low interest rates. So Carl worked at E.F. Hunton all the way from 1961 up until 1968, so he spent seven years there working as a clerk. And then eventually, he started working, he built, he actually started his own brokerage firm just specializing in options and trying to help people. And his first deal was a hostile takeover of an airline. This is really Carl Icahn's first big deal that, that he's well, well known for. 
a hostile takeover, meaning he came in without really the consent of the management. There's such thing as a hostile takeover where once they own enough, they just come in and, and really re and shake things up. That I'm coming in here, I've done it, and there's no way that I'm leaving until they do something. That's eminently refinanceable. That's He's been hunting new down That's vulnerable corporate prey called. since the 1980s when he was reviled as a black hat corporate raider. Why does everybody say that you're the man everybody loves to hate? Love to hate? Well, you're hurting my feelings. That's me interviewing him in 1986 after he took over TWA. Are like an unfair to flight attendants. He was seen as ruthless because he fired people, slashed salaries, cut roots. The management of TWA, it's true, should have done this a long time ago. And as the company went into bankruptcy, siphoned off money for himself. I own it. It's my money. I worry about the bottom line because if I lose, you know, I'm answerable to my bank account. Back then, when Icon targeted a company, management would often pay him so-called green mail just to go away. There was a lot of pushback from the management trying to keep our, Carl Icahn out of this deal, and they, they just couldn't do it. What ended up happening to fund the purchase of this airline, Carl Icahn borrowed millions and millions and millions of dollars. Once he owned the company, went through and used that money to buy the company, once he owned the company, he looked at all the assets that they owned and realized that he had, you know, he had total control. He looked at all the assets they owned, sold off all the assets. This type of strategy it's not really possible to implement because they realize what's what you know what was happening and during the 80s is really when you know you start to see a huge surge of this and Gordon Gekko in Wall Street you know where he said greed is good he was meant to portray Carl Icahn so today you fast forward and you see there's many companies that he actually left the management in place or there were times that the management actually needed to be ousted because they were overspending on behalf of you know money that really belonged to the investors so you look at it corporation and how the corporation's assets are utilized is up to you know it's up to the board it's up to the management and so sometimes you know Carl Icahn is actually helping the investors that genuinely you know genuinely are being taken advantage of so he'll come in and, and explain to them what his issues are so he called up Apple actually wrote a letter to Apple and explained to them why you know shareholders should have a larger dividend payment they have all this cash that's sitting idle that they're doing absolutely nothing with and uh, you know, so they could be paying investors a higher dividend, so they actually changed their dividend payment after Carl Icahn wrote them. Another example of a great investment that Carl Icahn made where he didn't remove the board was Netflix. He was in that for about 14 months, really saw this interesting trend. I think his son partially was one, the one who brought it up, but he invested you know, about 300 million bucks and turned that into 1.9 uh, billion in 14 months. So you think about the return on investment and the percent return that, that he got from that, that's a pretty crazy return on investment in 14 months. You know, that's, most people are looking for very, very small returns and their you know, 20%, 30% returns in a stock is great in a year, but he did you know, multiple factors of 10. So let's talk about the portfolio structure of Carl Icahn because it's really important that whenever we study these people, we also study the structure of their portfolio so that we can then ourselves learn something. So Carl Icahn, his top four positions make up more than 5% of his, his, his portfolio. Each and every one of them is more than 5%. His top position is 47% of his total portfolio, which is Icon Enterprises. And Icon Enterprises is the holding company that owns all these different multiple companies that he acquires stakes in and whatever. So many of his positions that he holds are in the industrials, energy, pharmaceutical type area. Part of the reason that he's in pharma is because of his background. He actually spent some, some time in med school, realized that it wasn't for him, that he really didn't want to be a doctor. He said one of the greatest things that he did for humanity was not becoming a doctor. So I guess he just thought he'd be a terrible doctor. So while he was in med school, you know, I'm sure there's things that he learned about pharma. So taking that information instead of just putting that in the back of his head, really implementing that in a strategy where he can invest in pharma companies with a lot more knowledge and, and understanding than, than the typical investor. So Carl Icahn is a lot less diversified than the average investor that you see. He has like 20 holdings right now in his portfolio. If you look at Ray Dalio, he's, he has hundreds of positions and they're all just a very small fraction of the total portfolio. You can't really take an activist stake unless you're willing to take large positions in companies and put up a lot of money. So it's a, it's a different, different way of playing the game. Like I said, his average holding time is about 18 months. So he'll hold a stock for 18 months, 
and sometimes it'll be shorter than that just depending on if he can get really quick capital appreciation. Some of the things that he says that are super interesting is that number one, he says trading is, a, is, an, is an art, not a science. So it's basically saying that there's intuitive things that everybody does that you just can't get a sense for, can't get a feel for. You have to be, and you have to learn how to become your own artist, right? And to play the game in your own way and paint your own picture. The biggest thing with Carl Icahn, he's a contrarian investor. Like his Herbalife position that he took as a contrarian investor against Bill Ackman, and Bill Ackman laid out this really good scenario for why Herbalife was like a scam, a pyramid scheme, whatever, and that uh, you know didn't didn't really think that the company had the same value that others thought. And I do I do actually agree with Bill Ackman in his assessment that there's some things that are doing that are not good practices in business. Current market conditions, Carl Icahn actually since 2016 has been pretty bearish in the markets and. You know, kind of taking this view that a lot of the companies have been doing really well because of the fact they're using all these buybacks. And you know, so when they, when they buy back shares, it changes the what the earnings per share number looks like, which then changes price to earnings ratio and valuations if investors are not diligent enough to look and see that they have a share buyback. It's a tactic used to try and manipulate the perception of the company. So there's a lot of companies that are doing that. And it's not it's not unethical or illegal, it's just it's just not something that really changes the value of the company altogether, it just changes the way the value looks. And so he's been pretty bearish knowing that the cycle is ending. Clearly we're not at zero interest rates anymore. A lot of companies slowed in 2016, especially the ones that are, you know, were issuing a lot of debt because of course they couldn't raise new debt at lower rates, keep growing at that same rate, doing the same stuff. And he's a fundamental investor just like, just like us all. He's even more fundamental than me because of the fact that he's an activist, he needs to understand every last aspect of even how to negotiate some of these contracts and agreements. So that's all fundamental investing. Um, so great example of what to look at from a fundamental perspective. Um, anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed. We're going to do a lot more case studies. Let me know who else we should talk about next, who else you want to study, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that person.